this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review and today we're going to do a three-way tablet comparison. Now this isn't so much a smackdown to say one is better than the other. This is to help you folks decide who can't figure out which tablet is best for you. On the right we have the iPad 2 and right now it's sitting in a keyboard case. In the center we have the Asus ePad Transformer Prime to represent Android tablets. And on the left we have the Samsung Series 7 Slate which is a Windows based tablet. Windows 7. Windows 8 ready pretty much, and uh, right now it's, it's the best uh, among slate form factor Windows tablets, of which there aren't many. We're going to tell you about each of these in detail so you can figure out which might be best for you. First we're going to take a look at the iPad 2. Now I'm sure many of you have seen this in stores. It's available everywhere and you know what it looks like. Very thin. It's about a third of an inch thick and it weighs about one and a third pounds. So also very light, so we're not going to take it out of the case at the moment. You can also check out our video review of the iPad 2. But what we're going to discuss right now is how you can use this to do more in your life than just sit there on the couch and surf the web and maybe play some videos. And that's why we've got it set up in this Senna keyboard case. Now there's a lot of keyboard cases out there. In fact, there's also standalone little Bluetooth keyboards, variety of sizes you can use. So for those of you who are into content creation, maybe you want to use word processing, something like that, do spreadsheets, even write blog posts, that kind of thing. It certainly is possible, and this makes for a nice, compact, kind of portable and protected. So, so even though iOS devices are billed primarily as content consumption devices, here you obviously have the hardware tools to do more. Also, you've got things like WordPress, for those of you who do like to blog, there's documents to go, there's Apple's own Office compatible suite, all sorts of things you can use if you want to do document creation. Now, the challenge with the iPad is still getting stuff on and off, because everything happens through iTunes, which is quite different from Android, where you can just load stuff on an SD card slot and put them on there, documents, images, videos, anything that you want. Everything that you do is going to have to be through iTunes, including document transfer. Now, there are a lot of extensions to iTunes at this point. A lot of applications support transfer of stuff while inside of iTunes, but that's something to keep in mind depending on the kind of document formats that you want to use. But for Office documents and standard MP3 music files or iTunes format music files, no problem. Videos, likewise, are pretty easy. And this is a product I still would recommend for people who primarily want to do content consumption. iTunes makes it very easy. Besides the fact that you've got the iTunes store, and if you're a big customer of iTunes and you bought a lot of TV shows or movies and that kind of thing, or rentals even, for download. If you've got your own video and you don't know how to convert stuff, where to put it, all that kind of stuff, which I know a lot of folks don't, iTunes will handle it. Just drag something that it can actually read into iTunes, and it'll put it in there, and it'll convert it to the necessary format to use on the iPad. So for those of you who find all that stuff too much of a headache, and we're talking about DRM-free content here, if you've got stuff that's got DRM on it, like DVDs and all that stuff, well, that's a different story. But for non-DRM stuff, say iTube videos, that kind of thing, not a problem. So definitely the most turnkey, and also it's a very easy to use interface. You've got iTunes right here, which gives you a very good approximation of the desktop experience of iTunes. Easy to use, easy to search for stuff, and you've got different categories here, pretty much like any iOS device that you've used recently or seen. And for videos, anything that you've loaded using iTunes, for example, we've got an episode of Lost here and an episode of 30 Rock, they all just show up here. You don't have to do anything special. And they're all formatted well to work on the device. And it's just as simple as tapping on it, you get a little description, and you hit play. And there it looks great. Now because this has a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, 1024 by 768 on like most other tablets, you are going to see the black bars when watching movies and a lot of TV shows. Likewise, the music player, very easy. Pretty much all music these days is DRM free, so you don't even have to worry about that so much. But anything you buy from the iTunes store or any other stores in MP3 format or AAC format is going to play here. And it's a pretty straightforward interface. Not the world's most exciting, but works just fine. You can do playlists, you can do all that kind of stuff. Plays in the background. All, all the devices we're going to look at today can play music in the background. Continuing on to look at content consumption, you can see we have Netflix right here. And that's another place where the, the iPad is more evolved. It is the most mature platform right now. We've got Netflix on Android as well, but there's no Hulu Plus yet for Android tablets. There is Hulu Plus for this, so if you're looking for streaming services that you pay for, you're going to find the best support right now on the iPad too. Netflix, Hulu Plus, that kind of thing. One thing you won't get though is Amazon Video On Demand, and we'll talk about that when we look at Android where you can, and of course the Windows tablet. 
When it comes to books, just the same on all these tablets. You have the Nook application, the Kindle application, uh, all that stuff is available. And of course there's Apple's own iBooks too. I'm not sure how popular that's become, but they are doing a textbook initiative right now. So it's great for reading books. Now, as to whether you like to read on LCD, that's a different discussion. There are e-ink readers as well, but for those of you who are interested in reading on a large format product, it works well. And it's relatively thin and light, so it's not bad to hold while you're reading. Also, you've got Zinio on this. You also have Zinio on Android and on the Windows product as well, though. Really nice full magazine presentation. Now, when it comes to gaming, again, that's where the iPad 2 really shines. There are games for Android, but y you can count on a couple of hands about the number of 3D, really high-quality games that there are for Android. And the iPad 2 is the mobile platform right now for games, all high-quality Tier 1 titles and a whole lot of casual games and some free games and stuff like that. And of course, the ubiquitous Angry Birds. But if you're really wanting to play games, especially really nice-looking 3D games, they're here. And prices are about the same on Android versus iOS for, for those high quality games too. They're typically somewhere between 5 bucks to 10 for some of the hottest new release titles depending if it's from a big company like EA or something like that. They often cost more when they first come out. Now getting back to content creation, uh, you can do more than just office documents and blogging with this. There are basic things like Adobe Photoshop Express. Now this isn't the most full feature. They will sell you packs that you can do even more with. But here we have a Photoshop Express installed. And again, this is also available from Android for Android as well rather. And here we go, we can do sketch, soft focus, sharpen, reduce noise. Some of the, the handy basic stuff that you would want to do to a photo are here. Saturation, exposure, black and white. That's, there we go. Turn our cap black and white and there's a little undo button here. So you've got some stuff like cropping as well. So there's some basics here even for photo editing. Say you want to upload some stuff to your blog or something like that, you want to clean up the photos first, you can do that. In terms of expandability, well, not so much with Apple products. There is no SD or micro SD card slot here. But again, everything has to be loaded through iTunes anyway, so the utility of that, I suppose, would be kind of dubious, given the way the file system works. There is just the sync port on this. You don't have any micro USB or anything like that. Pretty much you're just going to connect this to your PC to use iTunes. Now, you can get a USB camera connection kit, they call it, to, to use an SD card with this guy that's sold separately. And there's also HDMI adapter you can use if you want to plug this into the TV. But unlike Android tablets, there's no DLNA for wireless streaming, or unlike Windows tablets and computers too. So you're not going to be doing wireless streaming, and clearly there's no Wi-Dye, which is something wireless display we only see on Windows PCs, and not on tablets so far. So that's the iPad too. Definitely awesome for you folks who pretty much are into content consumption. You can do some creation, as we covered as well, but it's, that's really where it shines. It's very easy to watch Netflix, Hulu Plus, iTunes videos, and iTunes will handle converting videos to the correct format when you're syncing to this device here, making it easy as well. No must, no fuss, no worry about putting things in the right directories. Next up we have Android, and we're using the ASUS ePad Transformer Prime, which is the poster child for cutting-edge Android tablets right now, because it's the first quad-core tablet in the world, actually, on any platform, and it's running the latest Android OS 4.0 ice cream sandwich. Now this is the most interesting and versatile tablet, at least right now. Lenovo has a trick or two up their sleeve coming as well, but besides the fact that you've got that, that really fast quad-core CPU and a wonderful IPS Plus display, very bright, it's also very thin and very light. As you can see here, it's about a third of an inch, and it weighs 1.29 pounds, actually slightly less than the iPad 2. But what's really innovative about this is the optional keyboard dock. This is the tablet, 32 gigs will cost you $4.99, so that's that, and you can also get it with 64 gigs for $5.99. But slide this little release latch here. I'm going to take it out from the keyboard dock. Here it is. It's just a regular old tablet now. And this keyboard dock sells separately for $149. And those of you who watched our video review would know about this already. It has a secondary battery in here, so it extends battery life. You go up to about 12 hours using these together, which beats everything else that we're going to show you today. Certainly it's going to beat the iPad too, even the Samsung Slate. Full QWERTY keyboard, trackpad, you've got full-size USB port and a full-size SD card slot here. Now this actually works with USB peripherals, so this is much more versatile than the iPad for those of you who are looking for more of a computer placement replacement, and that's exactly what this is. This is a stand-in for somebody who's looking maybe at a netbook, but it's not powerful enough, too small a screen, or perhaps an ultrabook, but they don't want to spend quite that much money. 
So together, the two of these guys are going to set you back $6.50 if you buy a brand new from the store. Which isn't cheap change, but then again, you know, you get a lot of usability for this. It's very fast, very responsive, much faster than any netbook running on an Intel Atom CPU. If you've ever bought one of those and used them, you know they're sluggishly slow. They tend to have low quality displays, whereas this has one of the best displays I've seen on any device so far. And you get that instant on experience that you get with Android. With Android, obviously, because there is only one iPad, you also get more range of choice, also, including Windows Slate PCs, because there aren't that many of them. You can get these in a variety of price points, different form factors, some are thicker, some have USB ports, some don't, like the Acer Iconia Tab A200 review, it has a built-in USB full-size port right on the tablet itself, you don't even have to buy a dock. And that means you can plug in flash drives, mice, keyboards, hard drives, even USB-based game controllers, which is really bri bridging the gap between a tablet and a regular full PC. Most all Android tablets, with a few exceptions, notably Samsung, oh, hello Samsung, have either a micro SD card slot or a full-size SD card slot, so if you want to bring media onto this or documents or anything like that, it's just as easy as putting them on a card and sticking that card in here. Now that requires a little bit more computer savvy. You need to use a card reader or mount this guy using your USB cable and actually know what you're copying and where you're copying. Actually, you can put stuff pretty much anywhere. You can put movies in any folder or not in any folder, music, all that kind of thing, documents, and your applications will find them anyway. But when it comes to things like converting for file format, pretty much MPEG-4 H.264 format is the way to go. Now, if you already don't know what that means, Android might not be for you unless you're willing to learn about how to convert videos to that format. Pretty much standard YouTube downloaders all download in that format. It's also the same format used by iOS devices, so it's pretty commonly available, actually, if you're downloading content that doesn't have DRM. When it comes to things like DRM-based content and streaming media, you can see we have Netflix here. Works beautifully on this device. There is no Hulu Plus, as I mentioned, for Android tablets, so, so you're not going to find support for that, nor can you use iTunes content that Apple sells you on one of these if it has any kind of DRM on it, and pretty much all Apple videos have DRM, but not the music. So you can bring music over, that's not a problem. And we'll go with our favorite Wallace and Gromit lately, so you can see Netflix streaming up. So here we go, streaming beautifully, and this is a widescreen display. This is a little bit higher resolution, 1280 by 800. That's a standard for Android 10-inch tablets. So if you watch a lot of movies, it's kind of nice. You avoid some of the big glaring black bars you get on a 4x3 aspect ratio. Speaking of aspect ratio, one place where it's less ideal is when, re when reading ebooks. Now, 4x3 feels kind of more natural, like the size of a book page. So you have to get, long, get used to a kind of a longer, narrower column if you're holding this guy in portrait mode. And of course, just like the iPad, it rotates to portrait mode. Also, Android tablets in general, just like the iPad, they're often available in just Wi-Fi only versions and ones that have 3G or 4G. But that really depends on the tablet you're looking at. For example, Asus does not make one with 3G or 4G, but Samsung does. So does Acer. So you get the idea. So sometimes you might find your favorite tablet, but if you really don't even have 3G or 4G, it might not actually offer that. Well, application selection for Android is quite large at this point, and many applications that work both on phone and tablet, despite what you've heard about there only being 100 tablet apps. That's not true anymore. There's plenty of tablet apps, and all the popular staples are there, your weather, your news, all that kind of stuff, USA Today. We've got Zinio here as well. Also, we can do Photoshop Express on this, just like we can on the iPad. And we're going to show you what Zinio looks like. So here we've got Zinio. Obviously, it's a little bit small right now. It's best done if you're going to use this in portrait mode to fit a full-size magazine page. And we're checking out National Geographic right now. So here we've moved it to portrait mode. You've got your text here, very readable. You can also do things like pinch zooming if you want, and you can just look at a text-based view. Tap in, and then you can change. So it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Certainly, I mean, it's even prettier than the printed version of National Geographic to look at this. So also good for content consumption. In other words, though you don't have as many options in, in terms of DRM movies and TV shows. Another strong point for Android is the customizability. It, it's got a little bit more to learn because you're not just looking at the, the palette just of application icons, sort of the way you are in iOS. But you've got all these desktops here. You can put all sorts of widgets, handy things like that. And make it the way you like it, basically, which is pretty cool, too. Both have very capable web browsers, and they're WebKit-based. 
Android has Adobe Flash, as you've probably heard by now. iOS doesn't. Of course, a couple of years from then, that's not going to matter so much because Adobe has decided to halt development of mobile Flash. But in the short term, as you know, there's a lot of websites that use Adobe Flash, including Amazon Videos On Demand. If you like watching Amazon Videos, you have a Prime membership. You can actually do this since this has a Adobe Flash player. Likewise, you can watch Crackle movies using, using the actual Adobe Flash based one like you would on the desktop. Now, sometimes those can be a little bit bulky, though, because these guys are pretty powerful, but they're still not as powerful as desktop computers. But it gets the job done. Now I want to touch on keyboards for use with Android. Of course, you get something like the Asus E-Pad Transformer Prime, you get something fairly unique here with this dock. But there are actually keyboard cases available for some Android tablets. The Samsung Galaxy Tab 10.1, for example, there's a keyboard case. Lenovo makes one for their ThinkPad tablet. And there are third-party ones. Now this is a Samsung Bluetooth keyboard that actually goes with the Windows Slate we're going to look at next. But this looks pretty much like several that are on the market that are marketed at Android that have Android keys on. So you get the idea about the size and the quality. They're, they're pretty nice. This looks almost just like Motorola's Bluetooth keyboard for Android, which is a lovely, lovely keyboard. And then we have the Logitech one right here, which is kind of neat because it's got this protective carrying case if you want to bring it with you. And this also turns into a stand for your tablet. And then you've got this pretty nice keyboard here, too. So there's a lot of keyboard options available. Really, they use Bluetooth, so pretty much any Bluetooth keyboard is just going to work. So we just looked at Android tablets. Prices for new ones range from about $350 up to, well, up to $900, depending on which one you get. Now, most of the ones that are Wi-Fi only, they're going to top out around 600 bucks for the highest capacity versions, and average around 500 for, say, 32 gigs of storage or so. But there are some that are more expensive. The HTC Jetstream, for example, that we did a video review of, you can check out. Now, that's a really nice tablet that HTC made. It has a dual digitizer. It has capacitive multi-touch plus an active Entrig digitizer. Entrig and Wacom are the two big players in making digitizers, and that means saying that works with an active pen like this for precise pressure-sensitive input. It's a really sweet tablet, but it's quite expensive It's because it's AT&T's first LTE tablet, and they decided to charge an awful lot for it. So without a contract, it's paying month to month. It's going to run you around 900 bucks or so. With a contract, it's about 700 last I checked. Maybe they've dropped a little bit, but I don't think so. There's also Lenovo's ThinkPad tablet for those of you who want an active digitizer with the stylus. Now, that guy is a Wi-Fi tablet, so prices are pretty reasonable. You're looking at around 500 to 600 for that. And last but not least, among 10-inch tablets that have a dual digitizer, there's the Motorola Zyboard. Also quite expensive. That one comes with Verizon LTE. You can sense a theme here. If it comes with 4G LTE, particularly on a carrier, it's going to cost you a lot more. And Again, you can buy that without a contract and pay month to month or with a contract. If you get it with a contract, it starts at around... 529 or so, and without a contract, depends on the capacity you buy, but you're looking at somewhere between $600 and $800 for that Zyboard. Zyboard also has the weakest pen support right now, not much going on with that driver, unfortunately. But there is a Wi Fi only Zyboard 10.1 now, too, and that's Zoom 2 to you folks who are in Europe. And that guy is a much more manageable $500 to $600, depending on the capacity that you want. And that all segues into this. This is a Windows 7 tablet. This is the Samsung Series 7 Slate. A lot of S's there. And again, we have a full video review of this product and written review as well. Now, throw away everything you ever thought about Windows tablets because this guy weighs just under 2 pounds. That's, that's quite light. Considering that last year's Android tablets averaged 1.65 pounds, you're not looking at much more weight here. In fact, if you're, if you're looking at the ASUS ePad slider, the one with the built-in slide-out keyboard, that one weighs 2.1 pounds, so about the same. It's also very responsive to touch, unlike most Windows tablets where they have these teeny little touch targets, you know, itsy little Xboxes that are really hard to manage with your hands, so you're always resorting to the pen. Samsung did a lot of tweaking here. Now, you can do these kind of things yourself, say if you have the ASUS ePad slate, which is a Windows tablet in the registry, but if you're if you're not really into doing that, you don't know all the places to go, Samsung has done it for you. And I find this to be just about as pleasant to use as an Android tablet or the iPad. It's really easy. You don't see me screwing around here and having trouble going to things. I want to go to control panels right now. No problem. I've got the full view right now. and It's very easy to do. Even the closed boxes here in the upper corners, I'm managing just fine. Ten points of capacitive multi-touch here. Don't know what you're going to do with all those ten fingers on there, but if you want to, you can. This pretty much has the brains of an Ultrabook inside, which means it's quite capable for business tasks and for some art tasks as well. It runs on an 
Sandy Bridge processor, 1.6 GHz dual core. It has 4 gigs of RAM that's soldered to the motherboard, and it has a fast 128 gig SSD. It's also available with the 64 gig, but that's really cutting it close after you install Windows, so I recommend going with the 128. So boot times on this, remarkably fast. Resume from sleep, just like the instantaneous. So it's not like your old Windows computer where you turn it on, you go off, you get a cup of coffee, come back and hope it's turned on. This guy, you turn it on and about 15 seconds later it's ready from a cold boot. And if you're just resuming, it's going to be ready in about 8 seconds. So once again, it feels a lot more like a mobile tablet. Samsung has also done this. They've given us this launcher here, which is kind of like shades of Android or iOS. And it's taking a little longer to load there because I just did some updating on it. So it's loading some new apps. You can put any app you want on this, by the way, but you've got shortcuts to your battery status, Wi-Fi, obviously your to-do lists are here, weather, clock, all that kind of stuff, and some built-in apps, and then they went ahead and they wrote a bunch of nice apps that are almost, I would call them mobile OS, like mobile optimizers. There's an RSS reader, there's a really friendly touch calendar. And this can sync to your Google Calendar, if you have one, day, week, and month views, list view, that kind of thing. So really nice, and you can just close that guy out. And go back here, there's an RSS reader that Samsung actually wrote. And this syncs to your Google news reader feed. And you can view this in a variety of ways by your sources, by whatever is newest, all that kind of stuff. So it works pretty well. Now this is a Wi-Fi tablet. This has Wi-Fi 802.11 BGN dual band. That's something to mention because most Android tablets and, and the iPad you know, usually you just get single band. Actually, the iPad is dual band as well. But for those of you who need that, you've got Intel Wireless Advanced N in here, and it also supports Wi-Dye Wireless Display. Now, uh, Intel Wi-Dye or Wireless Display means that you can wirelessly just transmit whatever's on your screen here to an HD TV or running it through a receiver, whatever you have that has an HDMI connection. And we use the Netgear Push to TV HD. That seems to be the most popular. It works pretty well. 99 bucks. So if you're not familiar with Wi-Dye, that's what that does. And what's pretty neat is you can throw a movie on the TV screen and still have access to your desktop on this. So you can be using this to write a Word document, surf the web, whatever it is, while you've got streaming an HD video to your TV. Of course, it also supports DLNA because it's a Windows machine if you like to do your streaming that way and you don't want to get involved with Wi-Dye. And it has a micro HDMI port. And this little docking station here, we'll show you in a minute, has a full-size HDMI port. So a lot of output options. Something else that's important to mention is this is full Windows. This is Windows 7 Home Premium 64-bit. That means everything you can do on your computer, you can do on this. No worrying about, oh, is there a Hulu Plus available for this? Can it handle Amazon videos on demand for my Amazon Prime membership? Yes, it does all that stuff. And also, if you want to do content creation, clearly a Windows machine or a Mac, if such a thing was available in a Mac format like this, is the way to go if you really if you want full office. Now you can run office on the iPad, you can run office on Android, but they're very basic versions of the full office suites that are available for Windows. So things like even spell checking other than your keyboard autocorrect, not there. If you want all the formulas and functions in a spreadsheet, full presentation creation capabilities, they're not there in the mobile versions yet and they're just not up to handling at that point and the software has been so well developed. So this guy for serious work certainly and Adobe Photoshop, you bet we've got Adobe Photoshop 64-bit installed here, CS55. So here you can see we've got the full Adobe Photoshop CS5.5 extended running on this. So that means serious image editing is, is possible here. You can also do video editing on this. Certainly it's much more capable than mobile options on the iPad, though you have that cool little movie editor available on the iPad, but th this can handle much more serious work. Now, still for editing 1080p video, well, you know, you want a more powerful Windows computer to do that, because this is going to be a little bit slow, but you have Windows Movie Maker, you can use Adobe Premiere, what, all that kind of stuff on, on this if you really need to on the road. And in terms of ebook reading, yeah, you can do that too, and because it's two pounds, it's a little on the heavy side, but it's not insurmountably heavy, especially if you're using a stand or you got it with the dock, so we've got Kindle installed right here. So here we've got the book open, and you're probably going to want to hold it in portrait mode, but that's up to you. But obviously it's going to be very fast and responsive because this is a very capable dual-core computer right here. 
So yeah, you can do every ebook reading application on the planet for Windows is going to run on this guy too. So you're getting the theme here. This is actually a very versatile tablet. It's very touch friendly and much more powerful and you're not locked into worrying about what runs on your mobile platform. Even Windows games, now you're not going to be playing Crisis 2 on this because this just uses Intel HD 3000 integrated graphics, but it can handle casual games, it can handle older games just fine. The drawback with this, well, one thing is it has about six hour battery life. Now that's not really much of a drawback. Last year we looked at the ASUS ePad Slate Windows tablet, which was a 12.1 inch, this is 11.6 inches, and that only ran for about two, two and a half hours on a charge. So six hours, you're getting up there with what some Android tablets can do. Still not as good as the iPad running in about eight to nine hours, but lots of time on the go, despite the fact that it's a Windows tablet. So not a huge drawback in that case. The other is the price. Windows tablets cost more, but then again, you can do a lot more. And if you need to do those things, if you don't want to just use this, say, to watch videos and surf the web and stuff, you don't need all this other stuff, that's another thing. But if you really want to be able to do all these things and use the active digitizer pen, then it's probably worth the money. Let's put it that way. This guy sells for about $1,000 just for the tablet, and it comes in bundles. You can get it with the Samsung Bluetooth keyboard we have here. Any Bluetooth keyboard is going to work, folks. You can plug in a USB one as well, though, but it's a nice keyboard, actually. And you get the docking station, too, in some bundles. You can get them all bundled together. You can get ones with just the docking station, too. And the docking station is a nice little sturdy bugger. And again, you can watch our full review to learn even more about this. But here's the foldable top. So this just folds down for portability. And back here we have the headphone jack. We've got a full USB port, full-size HDMI, and gigabit Ethernet, as well as where you plug your power in. So you can just drop it in the dock to charge it. Tablet itself has one USB port and it has a micro SD card slot up top over here and it has micro HDMI out so you don't have to get the dock just to do HDMI out. And you can see we've got Corel Painter 12 coming up and that's the other thing for those of you who are graphic artists this guy is a lovely choice. It has 256 levels of pressure sensitivity and I have actually found this a lot easier to set up to work with both WinTab application that means pretty much every drawing application on the planet except for Adobe Photoshop and also at the Wacom drivers. Just download both of those from Samsung's website and you're good to go. You get pressure sensitivity and all that good stuff in both. And we're not going to do a full drawing demo here but just so you can see this is a Wacom digitizer, a Wacom pen and we've got pressure sensitivity pressing hard right now and I'm using a fat oil brush so it works just fine. With 11.6 inches and 1366 by 768 display, it's great. Speaking of which, this has a 400 nit very bright display, so it's very good for a variety of uses. Glossy display, just like the mobile OS tablets. And it's not IPS display according to Samsung, but it has pretty much the same viewing angles. It's gorgeous looking, lovely, so it's certainly comparable to the iPad 2 and the Asus ePad Transformer Prime. So the Transformer Prime is the brightest tablet on the planet right now. That's blindingly bright, so they designed these so you can use it outdoors. And last but not least, for you note takers, I know some of you are looking at the Lenovo ThinkPad tablet and even the HTC Jetstream because you like to take notes on the go. And with this, with Windows 7, you've got pen support pretty much anywhere and the most powerful version of note taking with text, handwriting recognition to text as well. So we've got OneNote 2010 running right here. You can see you can do that. You can do Windows Journal. You can just write on the page, you can type on the page, you can write and then turn it into text later. So definitely if you're into serious note-taking, that kind of thing, you, you need to convert those into office documents later. Windows tablet is still your best bet. And thanks to Samsung, we actually have something that's finally portable and competitive enough with mobile OS tablets that as long as you can afford one of these guys, you don't have to kind of make do with something less if you really need to work with this kind of stuff. So that's our three-way tablet comparison, one from each platform. Again, not to say one is better than the other, but each one is suited to different things. We have the Samsung Series 7 Slate on the left, 11.6-inch Windows 7 tablet, the Asus ePad Transformer Prime Android 10.1-inch tablet in the center with the optional keyboard dock, and the iPad 2 right now sitting in a center keyboard case. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Don't forget to watch our video reviews of each of these products, read our full written reviews on our website, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.